Uh, well, uh, good evening, everybody, and um, thank you, Rob, for the opportunity to speak on this subject, which is, seems to me, the most important subject of all. It seems to me that if we get it right for children, then all of the things that we want to see for Scotland, creativity, talent, innovation, and achievement, will fall out of that um, and be achieved through that. Um, so this is uh, um, something that's very close to my heart and very close to, to what uh, Scottish Book Trust um, does every day uh, in every community around uh, Scotland. Um, a lot of what I'm going to say is going to echo um, what has already been said. Um, and I would certainly concur with Cathy that we're generally doing very, very well in terms of our practices and policies towards children. Um, and, and, and we're getting that right, and we're thinking about it in the right way. However, I have been asked to um, provide a provocation, and so I will. Um, and I want to talk about um, poverty, really. Um, one of the questions that Rob asked us to answer is, what is life for, uh, like for children and young people in Scotland today? What helps, what, what doesn't? And obviously that's an enormous question and needs to be broken down. And there are different layers and different layers of need um, according to a child's um, postcode and socioeconomic uh, and family situation. Um, today I want to talk about the 25% of Scottish children that live in poverty. Oh God, excuse me. Um, and uh, that's around about 200, 250,000 families. And one of the things I found most amazing about that um, is that in half of those families, there is somebody working. You know, what kind of economic system do we have when people go out to work and can't earn enough money to raise themselves out of poverty? That is a real problem, and that is a, a baseline, if you like, for, for the job that we, that we have to do. Um, recently, North, uh, North Ayrshire Council um, uh, announced, uh, along with some other councils, that they provide uh, free school meals uh, to children uh, during the holidays. And I ask you, what kind of society uh, is it where, where children actually need to be fed by school when they're on holiday? That's, to me, an amazing thing. I mean, I think it's brilliant that they're doing it. Um, and we know that North Ayrshire is a, a particular area of, of deprivation. But nevertheless, um, when we look at that, we, uh, I think, collectively have to say that's something that we need to, to fix. In addition, the uh, Institute for Physical Studies predicts that um, over the next uh, five years, child poverty in Scotland will increase significantly, so that by 2020... Um, we are uh, in a situation, uh, or likely to be in a situation, where one in three children in Scotland will be living in poverty. And I want to talk now about some of the effects of poverty and what that does to people. There's a huge amount of data on uh, the disadvantage, particularly in terms of child development and in terms of education that comes from poverty. Children, for example, from the most disadvantaged backgrounds are twice as likely to have a speech, language and communication concern at the 27, 30 month check. Um, research data using data, uh, data from the 1970 British cohort study shows that the effects of this is, is long lasting. Um, vocabulary scores at age five are associated with literacy levels as adults at the age of 30, uh, 34 or 35. So we're talking about something that is absolutely central to our business of providing the best start for children in Scotland that we can. And the same is true of, of, uh, of, uh, lit of uh, numeracy. 28% uh, of children from poorer families um, uh, compared to 56% of those from uh, more advantaged backgrounds um, uh, p perform well in, in numeracy, that's nearly half. Um, and one of the end results of this um, is that um, around two in every three pupils from Scotland's most deprived areas leave school without any qualifications. I'm going to say that again, two in every three pupils from Scotland's most deprived areas leave school without any qualifications compared to just over two in every five from the least deprived areas. And then further to that, again, 
fewer than one in 10 pupils uh, from the most disadvantaged districts in, in our country have been accepted or were accepted to university in 2015. Again, one less than one in 10 pupils. Uh, it puts us in mind of, of uh, some of the things that Jimmy Reid said uh, in Glasgow, looking you know, at some of the Glasgow housing schemes and uh, seeing, uh, seeing them as a, as a vast reservoir of unrealized talent. Um, <clears throat> if we are to improve um, as a nation, uh, if we are to invest in the future, this is something that we definitely, definitely need to fix. Um, and it's something that's been noticed elsewhere as well. So um, uh, the PISA results regularly um, say, uh, the PISA education results, um, which are, uh, compare results over around about 26 different countries around the world, and particularly in Europe, um, uh, assert that the link between deprivation and poor academic performance is especially acute in Scotland compared to other European countries. So we have any number of, um, if you like, policies. We have every number of uh, research um, reports that um, demonstrate very, very clearly to us that there's a persistent gap in attainment between pupils from the richest and poorest households in Scotland. And this gap starts in preschool years and continues throughout primary and secondary school. In most cases, <clears throat> it widens as pupils progress through the school years. And most importantly, as I've demonstrated with some of these, these facts and figures, the poverty attainment gap has a direct impact on school leaver destinations, and thus the potential to determine income levels in, in, in adulthood. Of course, it isn't just about income levels, it's about um, the whole of one's social being, if you like. Um, but the evidence is there, and um, it's something that we really, really need to address if we are to say that Scotland is the best place for all children to grow up uh, in. One of the effects of poverty um, it has to do with, um, and again, this connects to things that uh, both uh, Cathy and Madeline said, has to do with agency. It has to do with resilience. And what I mean by agency is one's own self-belief that one can act in the world and actually do things in the world and achieve things in the world and be recognized in the world. Um, a, a while back I was talking to um, Karen McCluskey um, from the, I used to be with the Violence uh, Reduction Unit um, in Glasgow, a really astonishing woman who's done incredible work. And she runs an informal um, get-together of um, around about 100 families in Castle Milk, which is one of the most deprived areas in Glasgow. And one of the things that she said about that group, which really struck me, was that she <clears throat> conducted a vote as to um, how many of those families um, felt a sense of, of, of hope and, and aspiration. And 70% uh, of, of, uh, of that 100 families, uh, 70 of those 100 families said that they didn't feel any hope um, and, uh, and, and therefore you know, had no aspiration. Um, this is something that we, ha we have to fix. Um, but of course, it, is, it goes part and parcel with uh, poverty, with unemployment, um, and with a post-industrial landscape that, that, uh, that Scotland has been left with. One of the really positive things that I think we can do and, and have done in the past is give um, young people the right to vote at the age of 16. Um, that directly correlates to agency. And um, I, I, certainly my own experience with my own family uh, during the referendum, you know, my kids went from I don't even know the difference between left and right to, you know, pinning me against the wall. Um, so um, it really works, and I think it's a, it's a, it's a very important thing. Un, unsurprisingly, though, I think that the, 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 the key aspect of agency um, lies uh, in the root of language. Um, language is power. Language is agency. The uh, ability to use language uh, the ability to communicate confidently um, to you know, language as a ground of thought itself um, is, is incredibly important and sits at the centre of, um, I think, many of the things that we have to do and, and many of the, 
the things that um, we need to invest in, in terms of um, children's education and their social being. There's a wonderful quote from Timothy Snyder's wee book on tyranny, which I'd urge you to get if you haven't got it already. Um, this is from chapter 14. Um, be kind to our language, avoid pronouncing the phrases that everyone else does. Think up your own way of speaking, even if only to convey that thing you think everyone is saying. Make an effort to separate yourself from the internet. Read books. This is all really good advice, and I'll return to the uh, question of the digital age uh, in a minute. Um, but that's all about agency. That's all about your language as your language and you being in control and confident and, uh, of the power of your language and of your opinions and, and of the validity of, of them. So agency is incredibly important. Now, the thing about literacy is it can't solve poverty, but it's impossible to deal with poverty without dealing also with literacy because literacy sits at the center of an interconnected web of effects which come from poverty. Um, literacy supports, indeed unlocks, learning in all other areas. It's crucial for developing employability skills and is a pre prerequisite for full, informed and responsible participation in social, economic, cultural and political life. Without literacy skills, health and well-being can be seriously impaired or even negated. That last is a quote from Sir Harry Burns, who was the former Chief Medical Officer for Scotland and who chaired the Standing Literacy Commission that I was on. And it completely demonstrates in, in a paragraph how literacy is in, interconnected with health, with education, with mental health, with all of those kinds of, of, of things. So where do we start? Well, obviously we start with the early years. These are really, really crucial, uh, crucial uh, years in which to get things right um, and which, in which to um, put parents in a position to, to, to get things right. Um, Harry Burns was very insistent on this. If you don't get it right in the first two years, then you're in trouble in terms of that child's development. I don't necessarily agree with that, but he's a chief medical officer. <laughs> so um, one needs to take that very seriously. And obviously the data from early years shows us this. The first few years of life lay the foundations for future learning. A child's brain doubles in size in the first year. And by the age of three, it's reached around 80% of its adult volume. Right? So that's absolutely crucial period. I want to say another thing about the early years of language development um, and um, social and child development, there's no evidence that mothers are innately better than fathers at stimulating young children's language development. But farmers, fathers um, often feel um, uncertain about it. Um, I th so I think one of the things we've got to do is talk to fathers much more effectively and get fathers much more engaged um, in, in, this whole, in this whole area. I've lost count of the number of times that I've been to library conferences, to international conferences on literacy, you know, and so on and so forth. And you look around the room and you can't see a man. What's that about? Why are men not invested in this? I think that's something that we really have to challenge as a society. And we have to get men to take their responsibilities seriously and to contribute to the family, to their children, and, 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 and wider, wider afield. One of the things I've been looking at um, in terms of preparing for this evening was uh, growing up in Scotland reports. Um, there's a, a new report, one that was delivered in December, about the poverty of aspiration. Um, and here is a slightly different point, but a very important point to make, I feel, uh, in terms of, uh, of dealing with this whole area. Um, and it, in a sense, um, uh, relates very directly to James, uh, James's story, uh, as, as Cathy told us. Uh, this report is saying, the attainment gap will neither be narrowed nor closed so long as policy focuses on children's educational outcomes rather than the factors that affect their outcomes, value, respect, dignity, understanding, inclusion, appreciation, and participation within school. So it's not just about the academic business of education, it's about the social um, envelope of school, 
uh, of education and of their and of their relations, uh, you know, in that in that envelope, um, and that's something that we really have to, to to zero in on, and we can't make the mistake of thinking that parents who live in poverty do not lack aspiration for their children. I read um, some some uh, research a number of years ago, which showed that. Um, parents without university education um, are actually much more likely than any other group of parents to take their children to the museum, to the library, uh, to, to the art, uh, to the art gallery, etc., etc. So that puts us in a position of saying, well, these parents, are, you know, want this help. Um, uh, they want the best for their children. Um, they understand. Uh, aspiration, and we should respond uh, very much to that. Um, and again, echoing um, things that Madeleine has said, um, this report goes on to say we need to focus on the mechanisms by which aspirations can diminish over time for young people. There's a very famous longitudinal study in California that was run, I think, begun in the 1970s and followed uh, a large group of children right the way through um, to higher education. And at every stage, they ask these children, um, are you an imaginative, creative person? And in primary school, it's like 99% of the kids said, yes, I am. And by the time they get to the end of secondary school, that's dropped to 20%, <laughs> right? So we need to, we need to understand that. So we're, and we need to focus on those mechanisms by which aspirations can diminish over time. We need to focus on keeping young people's aspirations on track because they, things never go to plan, all right? And that's where resilience comes in. That's where hope comes in. That's where encouragement and support come in. And we need to, uh, this is a, a, a big one, I have to say, um, dismantle the local and structural barriers to high aspirations. And one might add, you know, the social and economic uh, barriers um, that many children face today, and many families face today. Um, there's a... There's a push me, pull me thing going on. Our society is becoming more unequal, um, and yet we're desperately trying to kind of shore it up and, and make it more equal. Um, there are many, many socioeconomic things that need to happen in order to make sure that our society is more equal. And as uh, academics like Kate Pickett uh, in, in a wonderful book called The, the, the Spirit Level um, have demonstrated, um, we are all better off if we are all better off. Um, you know, uh, gaps in society, big disparities between people's uh, economic circumstances and social uh, circumstances are not good for our society. And the problem with Britain, uh, it seems to me, over the last 40 years is that we've become uh, a kind of free market, neoliberal, individualistic culture. I think that's slightly different in Scotland. We have a better idea of, of our country. We have a better idea of our communities. And um, we're more cohesive in that way. But we're not much more cohesive in that way. So that's something that we really need to, 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 to focus on because, again, if you read reports about attainment gaps in education, like there's a wonderful report from the Joseph Roundtree Foundation, uh, 2014, um, penned by Edward Susu and uh, Sue Ellis from Strathclyde University, um, you know, one of the principal things that will uh, help families, help children grow into uh, a better future um, are exactly these kinds of, kinds of measures and in, indeed jobs and opportunity. So now let me move on to the future and address some of the things that are coming at us from the rise of the digital world. It's certainly true to say, I would say, I, I would say that um, the world is changing from one that has been um, dominated by the logos, the word, to one that's dominated by the simulacra, the image. Uh, you'll notice I haven't shown you any images this, this evening. Um, so digital technology may be changing the forms and means by which we read, write, communicate, access information, but it doesn't remove our need to be confident, articulate, and skillful with language. Instead, it increases the need and extends its range. So there, are, you know, it's it's not a the digital world is a challenge, but there are not, it's not full of bad things. Um, there are some things that we need to be concerned about, which I'll get to onto 
uh, in conclusion. But one of the positive things about the digital world is that um, it makes access to information um, and access to content a lot more democratic, a lot more widespread. However, it does uh, require us, I think, and we think a lot about this at, at, at Book Trust, um, to redefine what we mean by literacy. The way that information is now commonly accessed from a variety of sources, print, digital, and visual, and the hypertextuality that digital enables posits a new idea of literacy that we should indeed have to embrace. That's not to say that that's all a good thing, but it is an inevitable thing. Um, for the last three or four years, we've been conducting a, um, a research project with uh, Strathclyde University and Oxford University into the differences of what happens in somebody's brain and what their brain, pre brain processes are when they watch a film and when they read a book. Now, the academics will be horrified at what I'm going to say next because they're a very cautious bunch um, and, uh, and they're very careful about what they can, complain, uh, can claim. Um, but really, at the end of the day, the processes, the brain processes that, come, uh, that, 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 that are required uh, and that are active when we are reading are much more total, they're much more complex. Um, and the reason for that is that film gives you everything you need. It gives you all the information. But when you read a book, you've actually got to fill in that information yourself. So your brain has to work harder. And one of the results of that is that you remember that experience. It goes deeper, if you like. You remember that experience a lot better than you would remember a film. And often films fade from the memory a lot quicker than books do. What about screen time? I mean, children in Scotland and elsewhere spend at least five hours a day in front of a screen. Um, as uh, Chris Hanlon from the University of Glasgow has said, this makes children, or over-reliance on screen makes children less creative and problem-solving, less able to persevere at tasks, less tolerant of unstructured time, and more tired. We need to, 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 to be aware of these things. The other thing I think the digital world is, is, is giving us is um, that light reading, what one academic calls reading on the prowl, that's moving on the internet between different uh, information and data points, um, is replacing uh, the traditional model of um, how, how, we, how we read, how we read a novel for example, which we would call deep reading. In other words, the immersion in a text um, that might take us a month to finish um, and that is a constant process over that month for us. Um, so that the meaning of reading is now becoming increasingly about finding information and often settling for the first thing that comes to hand rather than contemplating and understanding what we're actually reading and being immersed in it. One of the effects of this, and I, I think it's very important for a healthy democratic society, is that one's sense of um, critical relationship towards information changes. Now, I happen to think that critical relation to, to information uh, you know, is one of the, the cornerstones of democracy. Um, our ability to evaluate where that piece of information has come from, why it is in the form it is, why it's saying what it is, and what other information there may be that might contradict that or that might modify that. Uh, these are really, really important skills. Um, and again, are absolutely directly relevant to a person's sense of agency um, and uh, self-image as a, as a, as a, as a well-informed, active citizen of a democratic country. So, um, in conclusion, I would say that um, one of the dangers uh, that we, we are going to have to face uh, over, the, over the next um, 10, 20, 30 years is actually holding on to an idea of what the value of reading is and why it is valuable, and being able to communicate that and uh, to promote that practice. Um, in amongst particularly our young, our young children. Because the demands of a deep reading pro processes are 
going to be lost in a culture whose principal mediums advantage speed, multitasking, and processing the next piece of information. Readers will neither have the time nor the motivation to think through possible layers of meaning in what, in what they read. And the, the issue about reading is it involves sophisticated processes that include inferential and deductive reasoning, analogical skills, critical skills, reflection, and insight. In conclusion, um, I just want to quote from Frank Ferretti, who, who, who wrote a wonderful book about uh, reading and reading culture. Literature penetrates and shapes human thought. It transforms people's mentality. It alters the way they think and can, in certain, certain circumstances, shape their identity. It is the principal gateway through which questions of value are internalized, articulated, and clarified. That's why it's so important. Thank you.